everyone. Welcome to our first uh, reading for the spring quarter. Um, I'm Liesl Olson, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Mattia Harvey, uh, a poet whose work I really admire. Um, before I begin, let me just also say that Mattia will be giving a talk uh, tomorrow in Stewart 105, so not here, at 1, at 1, 1 p.m. And um, the talk is entitled, If You Agree, Won't You Change the Title for Me? Um, and she's told me that the talk will be about um, titles, type, strategies for titling um, both poems and, and um, art, uh, so it should be engaging. And as always, after this reading uh, this evening, there'll be a reception here, so please do join us. Mattia Harvey is the author of three beautiful, sharp, very smart volumes of poetry. Her first volume is entitled Pity the Bathtub, Its Forced Embrace of the Human Form. And with this title, you know that Mattia is a poet very interested in form and playing with constraints and definitions and finding the most amazing and whimsical ways out of them. If a poem is a bathtub, then you're held in place. But there is the pleasure of the water, and there's always room to splash. To quote from the title poem, within it we have control of how much hot, how much cold, what to pour in, how long we want to stay. In Pity the Bathtub, we have poems that blur the line between poetry and prose, poems that tell stories, poems as fables, poems that fundamentally seem to walk a middle ground between two sides of things, slangy and arch, formal and experimental. One of the things that I really admire about this first volume is her extraordinary attention to the poetic line, often a very long line, hinging at the break, its meaning revised by a brisk enjambment. And yet the volume is also full of incredible, fantastic stories, more the realm of imaginative prose. This becomes more pronounced in her second volume, Sad Little Breathing Machine, where her prose poems, as she describes them, are like tiny stories on narrative steroids. Mattia plays with hybrid form. Hybrids seem less a construct than a natural phenomenon in her work. She has, in fact, suggested that every person is a hybrid from the simple truth of having two parents. She has called herself half narrative, half lyric, half melancholy, half mischievous, half head, half heart. In her second volume, Sad Little Breathing Machine, which dare, dare I say is my favorite, a machine is the breathing body, the ins and outs of a breathing poem, a thing constructed like a mechanical tree or a force that duplicates but also a contraption that just might make some original confection. In the book's first poem, Introduction to the World, she writes, units are the engines I understand best. In another poem, she writes, I'm making a little machine. Not everywhere do cows move slowly among the trees like ideas. There is an audacity to her claims, even while the poems fixate on little things or slyly switch gears with a coy phrase that seems to come from the 1930s, from a coiffed woman on her third cocktail. There are a whole series of introduction poems in this volume, like Introduction to Eden, Introduction to Circumference, Introduction to Addiction, Introduction to Diction, and various others. And it's a bit intimidating to introduce a poet who's thought so much about introductions, especially since one of the poems claims, I don't need an introduction, no, <laughs> right? But in any case, these poems introduce us to various subjects as systems. And the poems often make use of strange typographical marks, suggesting that the machine of the typewriter or keyboard on which we compose has its own system, maybe a private system. We are imaginative beings, but are we systems too? The stunning last lines to the volume suggest that there is a part of the self, perhaps, that cannot be tucked away or ordered or put into a system or crafted into form. She writes, oh, the sleeping bag contains the body but not the dreaming head. Her third volume of poems, Modern Life, uh, which is just out, is a tour de force. Most immediately compelling are two long sequences, the future of terror and terror of the future. I suppose these poems could be said to take on our current American political situation although they seem to be set in a madcap, apocalyptic future, or even a peculiar prehistory. 
As Gertrude Stein said of her autobiographical novel about living in German-occupied France, there is nothing historical about this book except the state of mind. Mattia Harvey's war terrain, as in some of her other fable-like allegorical poems, is both playful and violent, like Japanese anime where a cute little cartoon girl also happens to be mutilated. Our poets, she writes in one poem, were Pied Pipers handing out photocopies, parodying, parenthesizing. With the right pomade, you can smooth over anything. These terror sequences are ABC Darian poems, which is to say that the poems move through words in a dictionary, starting with F and moving towards T, and then backwards for the second sequence. Mattia has written very thoughtfully about this process, and I, I don't want to repeat her here. But let me just say that the experience of reading these poems is very intense, while she retains yet yeah, her characteristic whimsy. Sometimes the letters seem to be doing so much work that the words, rather than the speaker, take over, despite the controlled handling of the form itself. We're at the mercy of what word will come next, what letter will have its lines. It's not unlike one of James Joyce's extraordinary catalogs, a list spinning out of control, the voice of a text machine that amplifies the English language, while inevitably signaling absence, all the words that can't fit into the poem. This seems right to me for war poems, that is, the anxiety of what are we missing? Furthermore, the repetition of the movement between F and T and back again takes us to the same starting point with each poem, even as the poems progress through, through something of a story. The sequence moves and doesn't move. Uh, we're at war, but we're not at war. Gradually, an I and you emerge out of the insistent we of the poems. While war might belong to a collective body, there is something deeply disruptive of private, imaginative, and erotic realms. There's much, much more to say about this new volume, but I'd rather have Mattia read from it. So without further ado, uh, please help me welcome her. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was amazing, and I feel like I don't have to do any work now. It's all been done. Um, it's a gray day, and I think that the grayness may have influenced the poems that I chose to read today. So if things get really, really gloomy, I'll try and put in find a happy one. Um, the first first two poems I'm going to read are the most recent ones that I wrote while in Iowa City, and um, I should say that there's an, invent an invention in here which doesn't exist. But um, I was thinking of. I think we were. I think we did this after Thanksgiving. We had hors d'oeuvres, and then the next day we were thinking, like, what do you call hors d'oeuvres the day after? And so we decided they were called jour d'après, day after. <laughs> and um, the other thing is, the title of this poem is, um, <coughs> there's a line in here, the subtlest way to admit adultery, and that's what the, line, the title is. And I'm not sure that would be apparent right away. Let your wife know with footsteps in snow. Because twilight is a triplet, Today we're beginning with C, and the puzzle is of a creek that freezes and unfreezes as you go. When the puzzle piece slots in, it's like Ziploc, ad hoc matlock. This is not the FYI convention, but I'll tell you about my inventions. An odor odometer, hors d'oeuvres serve the next day as jour d'après, flesh spackle for the cleft of chin, the subtlest way to admit adultery. Shall we count ourselves lucky? One, two, three. I'd like to sleep surrounded by sheep, but there you are with the backhoe. The next one is a prose poem, and I don't know actually really what these radio animals look like, but I've been thinking about what radio animals might look like. So they don't, they don't become very clear in the poem. I think they're probably kind of fuzzy. The radio animals. The radio animals travel in lavender clouds. They are always chattering, they are always cold. Look directly at the buzzing blur and you'll see Twitter, hear flicker. That's how much they ignore the roadblocks. They're rabid with doubt. When a strong sunbeam hits the cloud, the heat in their bones lends them a temporary gravity and they sink to the ground. Their little thudding footsteps sound like testing, testing, one, two, three from a faraway galaxy like Pitter and its petite echo, Patter. On land, they scatter into gutters and alleyways, 
pressing their noses into open Coke cans, transmitting their secrets to the silver circle at the bottom of the can. Of course we've wired their confessionals and hired a translator. We know that when they call us walkie-talkies, they mean it scornfully, that they disdain our in and out boxes, our tests of true or false. And I'm going to read um, just a, three little sections from my first book. This must be the gray day. Um, the poem is called Ceiling Unlimited Series, and it's um, a series of addresses to the sort of blank sky, and if God were there, maybe he, he or she would be addressed as well. Ceiling Unlimited Series. Oh, and Ceiling Unlimited is what they say when you can see all the way when there are no clouds in the sky. <coughs> Ceiling Unlimited series. Ceiling Unlimited. God of seed pods, we are wallowing in it. The hay has been gathered into gold rolls in the field. Why the calves in concentric circles? Why every other picket in the fence pulled out to be sold at the store? Yes, the papery poppies are a bit like the dry side of a foot, and hence the unnecessary massacre. But that's no reason to condemn the pelicans or throw out the wedding cakes when they turn gray. You said when a semi spills its cargo of oranges, the driver has a choice, flamingo on the salt flats or canary in the mines. I want the former. I've waited years for the Xerox flash and still no inkling. Lately, I've been thinking you love the groves and don't know how to tell us. I think you made the steps slick for a reason. Bottle Tower. Dear 930, is there any word for the way the peony blossoms bend over and rest their soft faces on the petals piled up in the grass? Tar cools and tires dull you. The puddles are milky and gray. There are daughters who die before their mothers, men mute with mistakes, birds with broken necks stuck to the sidewalk. The woodpile is full of the blank faces of owls. Today I want to live without looking. Give me that and I will give up the rest. Fat green buds bursting to split into pink. Trucks piled high with glittering tar. The way the rain gives the ground, the way the rain makes the ground give up its heat so that I feel it at my knees and the grass starts to smell like the sea. The trouble with these, um, wonderful little tabs. So sometimes you can't tell which side of the page you meant to mark. <laughs> Silver print. The lock sticks again. I can make a self-portrait out of anything. My silhouette in the window is all elbows. Blossom to stem, the rust roses on the pipes are blooming backwards. The head pushes its way out, learns how to waver later. Upside down in the spoon, I think I am getting closer. Second hand skimming time, blue windows everywhere, sharp smell of keys in the air. Where are you, inevitable slap? I have propped the storm windows against the side of the house for you. Twenty paintings of the sky and five grills heaped with charcoal so the air above them shimmers, shatters. Tell me I'm not just forging a copy. Tell me you're more than the moon. That's very odd. I feel older than that book today. <laughs> All right, which means I think I will go to the, the new one. One of the last times I visited Chiku and Suzanne here, um, they made me go and look at the figureheads in the um, art museum, and I was madly in love with them. And at the time I was writing this book, which is all about things being cut in half or being half robot, half boy, half cat, half goat. And so, of course, I ended up writing a poem about figureheads. And I titled it The Golden Age of Figureheads, and only later had a curious moment where I thought, I wonder if there was a golden age of figureheads. And there was. It was 1790 to 1920. <laughs> but I think mine might be a little bit different. The Golden Age of Figureheads. First, we sloughed off the sailors. When a storm hit, we'd lean into it and watch as they slipped into the water. One by one, we washed our decks clean, pried their rough fingers from our rudders. Now we can finally go where we want, swooping around archipelagos in packs, zigzagging along the paths the sun and moon make, skimming the Pacific solo. Sometimes we'll peer into the water to catch a glimpse of our old enemies, the anchors, glinting at the bottom of the ocean, 
the thick ropes that once tethered us to them, twisting and turning in the currents like snakes charmed out of their baskets by the song of the sea. We don't mind that our masts are crusted with salt, our rigging grows ragged, our bright paint, reds and golds and greens, has faded so that we're pencil sketches of what we once were. We don't even mind the barnacles that muffle our mouths. After all, we have no common language. The ship with a bird's head wants to squawk with the gulls that forage from its sails, would follow them into the water when they dive for fish, if only it could. Her ladyship, who trails sheets of seaweed like floaty green skirts, is lovesick for the sailor who used to stain her lips with wine before each voyage. But there is always the rain. When it falls hard enough, we can't tell which way is up, which way is down. Then we're like the earth before the equator was invented, like the giant tenor who unbuckles his belt and lets out his one truest note. I think I could have organized this reading according to rain, because I think there's rain everywhere. <laughs> I didn't even realize there was rain in that one. OK, a slightly cheerful poem. Um, there's a series of poems in here about a robot boy. And he's troubled, as most people are troubled, by being half robot, half boy. I mean, I don't mean you're all troubled by that, but I'm sure you're troubled by some sort of having. So this is a, a, a poem about some sort of mentors that his parents have provided for him. Emphasis on Mr. or Peanut, Robo or Boy. In the chapters on special children, the parenting books stress the need for role models. Hence, the silver frame portraits of Mr. Peanut, the Michelin Man, and Mrs. Butterworth in silver frames on Robo Boy's bureau. Robo Boy has never quite known what to do with them. For a while, he thought they might be estranged relatives, especially since his parents never mentioned them. Mr. Peanut, debonair as Fred Astaire, looks like the kind of uncle who might tell you over a steak and a cigar that with a pair of gloves and a monocle slotted over your eye socket, you can have your pick of the ladies. Mrs. Butterworth figured more in Robo Boy's brief religious phase. There's something holy in her maple syrup glow and in her shape, something of the Buddha. The Michelin man is the one who worries him. With his perpetual thumbs up and cheerful expression, he looks like he might be hoping to hitchhike his way the hell out of here. And this is another robot poem where um, Robo Boy um, becomes very magnetic, uh, hitting puberty. <laughs> Which is, it doesn't really happen to everyone, right? <laughs> Some of us become less magnetic when we hit puberty. <laughs> Lonesome Lodestone. Robo Boy is in band practice when it happens. A piccolo hits him squarely in the chest, then stays there as if superglued. He looks up and sees a metal wall consisting of the brass section, one tuba, two baritones, four trumpets, one French horn, lurching towards him. Thank God for Think Fast and Reflex, which have saved him from countless blacktop humiliations. The wall of gold metal hits the door with a giant clang as it closes behind him, then slowly slides to the floor, the treasure hoard of some mad musician king. Robo Boy runs home, noticing the stop signs bending towards him, the rings in the jewelry store pressing their sparkling noses to the glass, the grinning bracelets. The quilting circle doesn't see him through the window, but their needles take note, rising in his direction like plants that seek out the sun. One needle straining towards this new center of the universe pricks Mrs. Eisenstein's finger. Consider the drop of blood that falls onto the flowered fabric, the official marker of the beginning of Robo Boy's puberty. At home, locked in his room, Robo Boy is spitting out paper clips covering his ears so he won't hear the sound of the pots and pans rattling downstairs in the kitchen. This is a poem about, I don't know if this happens to you, there's so many people who are great poets in this audience, where sometimes a poem from, that you've had for a while fits into a third, like a new book, and you're like, oh good, that's great. So anyway, this was one that was actually couldn't make it into the first book or the second, but made it into the third. 
um, and it's about a, the Trojan horse. Inside the good idea. From the outside, it is singular, one wooden horse. Inside, ten men sit cross-legged, knees touching. No noun has been invented yet to describe this. They whisper that it would be like sitting in a wine barrel if the curved walls were painted red. The contents are not content. They would like some wine. They quarrel about who gets to sit in the head until finally the smallest man clambers in, promising to send messages back to the belly. He can only look out of one eye at a time. At first, there is nothing to report. Black, dark, the occasional star. Then, quiet footsteps mixed with questions. The children are clamoring for it to be brought inside the walls. The head sends back another message, which gets caught in the throat. They are bringing their toy horses to pay their respects to us, brushing their tiny manes, oiling the little wheels. It must be a welcome change from playing war. A theory of generations. You're it. You're it. You're it. That's one of the shorter ones. <laughs> Um, and then this, I think of this poem as being sort of a descendant of the Trojan horse because it's about um, creating pets that are empty that you can fill them with emotions. The Empty Pet Factory. My love works the night shift at the Empty Pet Factory. I've only been there once and I still have nightmares about the heartless hamster he had me hold in my hand. The rooms of inside out chihuahuas drying on racks. The pet wait list keeps getting longer. Celebrities love them. To the outside world, you can continue to seem like America's sweetheart, simpering, I do hope the fox gets away, as you dig your heels into a horse filled to the brim with vitriol and follow the flash of red over the hedge. Only the keenest eye could detect that you just screwed your horse's shiny eyes into its head after emptying handfuls of hate into its big glossy body. This morning over breakfast, he tells me excitedly that they've perfected the unrequited love puppies. Their chubbiness will serve as camouflage for the love bulging and straining against their doubly reinforced seams. He's getting toast crumbs all over his uniform. One lands inside the empty pet logo on his lapel, an outline of an indeterminate mammal. The cages stacked in the corner are quiet. The parrots think it's night when the covers are on. They're all factory rejects, couldn't learn to keep quiet the things they'd been told. At night when he's gone, sometimes I turn on all the lights and let them squawk the test secrets they've been fed in the laboratory, a glorious cacophony of, I hate your mother, your best friend made a pass at me, and I never liked your nose. I think one day he'll come home and find me in there with them, repeating over and over again, you don't understand me, you never have. A cheery one. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Okay. Um, and just to get worse, we'll go into the future of terror section. <laughs> so the future of terror, which were so wonderfully described by Liesl, I don't really have to say anything about except that um, the future of terror, they go forwards from F to T, and but don't pay too much attention to that or you won't be able to hear them at all. Um, and they tend to be more about the military, and then the other ones, terror of the future, tend to be more civilian but there's no real um, difference. They're just, everyone's confused. Okay, this one has uh, talks about homonyms, so that's have and have, as in H-A-V-E and H-A-L-V-E. I don't know if you can actually make that sound, have, how, how, um, yeah. The future of terror six. I guess that's the point of a homonym, so that you can't. All right, forget that. The future of terror six. There were girls waiting at the gate, but we were homonyms away from understanding each other, like have and have, like let me hold you and I hold you responsible. Hospital bed or house arrest were the idols we lived for. I promised to name my first born influenza for a better shot at the flu. A knot of spectators got killed and unraveled into the lake. We discussed the particular lattice patterns we like to use in our lasagna, 
Never mind that the party line was that we were lucky to get linseed cake. Oh, the milk of magnesia that required, mouthful after mouthful from mirrored spoons. The dye landed on a one spot, which was exactly how far we were going to get. One step into the orchard opposite, then chalk outlines for everyone. The pep rallies were horrible. The only thing that helped with the palpitations was to hold a paper nautilus to your ear and listen to the sighing of its parallel seas. Somewhere in there were seagulls whose pin feathers were starting to unfurl, families taking Polaroids of the piles of quahogs they'd collected, a shopkeeper opening his shutters while his space heater happily hummed with oil. In there, the spite fence had yet to be invented. The Future of Terror 10. At the last gathering, we each got a bowl of gelatin. I watched a grasshopper in the greenhouse crashing against the glass walls. There were a few civilian holdouts in the high rises hoarding their hemlock way past intermission. By now we were indifferent to them. Their pale faces at the windows no longer made us shiver in our thin khaki jackets. If only we could have thought of something to joke about, we could literally have had the last laugh. But my stupid mind kept making long-range plans, despite the middle ground between now and then being riddled with mines. One of the guys, nicknamed Milquitoast, started work on a monument. To what? No one knew. It was part trash heap, part mosaic. I added a nebula made from nylons wound around nails, which I imagined would eventually oxidize into the perfect hazy orange. People came to observe us, began shouting out suggestions. To placate one paralyzed soldier who brought us a pedometer permanently set at zero, we designed a spine of fake pearls. Other people left us pinking shears, a pram in pieces, a pumice stone, things that had once been precious to them. We put everything in. The army had abandoned its rallies and raffles, even the games of raise the red flag. Our rifles rusted on the ground and the sculpture grew. One day its silicon steeple began to show over the supply shed. I don't know who took the first shot, but I know that we all joined in. There was a wild spray of bullets, along with whatever else we could find to throw. When it crumbled, we stamped on the ruins. It felt great to tear something down again. And then going to Terror of the Future. Terror of the Future, one. If you had a talent for tea leaves, we put you in a tent and charged admission. Outside, people with syringes in their arms swayed sleepily in the summer wind. The shoe trees at home would preserve our foot shapes. Dried skim milk had an excellent shelf life and the safe was rust proof, so we scattered made the rounds of hotels, ordered room service, and tried not to recollect our children's quizzical looks as we showed them the jar of quarters, then locked the front door. The polls showed no one wanted to proceed alphabetically anymore. We were pioneers, and we thought we might make our way back to paradise if we spoke in the past perfect tense. Quick as a nod, it was October and the nectar was gone. The myocardiograph measured our heartache, and it was more than the manuals said we could manage. We positioned the light ship near the lemon cliff and waited. I put on my kick pleat skirt, best for jumping, and walked along the isthmus looking at the icy waves. Others decided it was high time to hike the Himalayas. For the first time, there was goodwill in the gold fields across the globe, then the last gasps in the garage. Terror of the Future 3. Our first protests were tentative. We tapped on their taillights with teaspoons, cut down all the swings the night before the Festival of the Children. We didn't know how far their patience would stretch, and we needed our applications to stay in the stack on the spokeswoman's desk. Oh, to be a somebody. Oh, to have a hearth and not a smudge pot. To their faces, we called them sir and ma'am without a trace of shame. 
One Saturday, they had a pig roast. Through the binoculars, the pig looked positively rococo with its curls of singed flesh, its glazed snout. We stood on the ridge and sniffed, hundreds of us, and I thought that perhaps their faces reddened, but it might have been the firelight. Proclamations about poultry in every household's pot were as far in the past as peacetime. The invalids held one-legged races to which we wore outlandish hats and dresses out of old organdy. We didn't have any medals for our muddy mortals, but a gang of girls rewarded the winners with blowjobs in the alleyway behind the mall, despite the magistrate's admonitions. Near the lending library, I found a key under a gum tree. I carried it around with me. Someone's home was a goner. It's always funny to realize that you're reading about blowjobs and your father-in-law is in the room. <laughs> I don't know what they are. It was just the word that was in the dictionary. <laughs> Terror of the future, four. You had to win the sweepstakes to get a survival kit. Some of the smarter Sunday painters kept suet and saran wrap stowed amongst their stencils. My sponsor disappeared with nary a splash. I didn't speculate. I said he was snowed under. All we ever did together was play Simon Says and try to outrun our shadows. It was a rotten routine and I'm not going to romanticize it. I wouldn't have put ribbons on his wreath, but I was hoping to qualify for the pre-harvest and a few jars of preserves. In the meantime, I sent my remaining relatives postcards with phoenixes on the front. No need to be a pessimist and think about the family plot. Yes, the panic-stricken and pain-ridden continue to dive into the Pacific, but one could get overstimulated thinking about it. I was no onlooker. I went shopping for a new look. I studied myths. I even invented a motto for myself. Never say mayday while there's still marzipan. When I was feeling low-spirited, it helped to think of the lion who was being given only lichen to eat. The lily-livered wouldn't look through the lens. I looked and saw that the scientists in the laboratory were looking for keywords in the judgment book, still hadn't jettisoned that piece of junk. It was time to make a home in the hedge and try not to hear the gunshots. So what if the grass was really green glass? That's a tongue twister. So what if the grass was really green glass? Okay, I'm just going to read two more. The decision is which two. I'm going to go with cheerful, maybe. Um, this one I find cheerful, even though it's sort of not cheerful at all. It's about a round baby, and so it seems sort of cheerful. Ideas go only so far. Last year, I made up a baby. I made her in the shape of a hat box or a cake. I could have iced her, and no one would have been the wiser. You know how trained elephants will step onto a little round platform, cramming all four fat feet together? That's her too, and the fez on the elephant's head. Applause all around. There was no denying I had made a good baby. I gave her a sweet face, a pair of pretty eyes, and a secret trait at her christening. I set her on my desk face up and waited. I watched her like a clock. I didn't coo at her, though. She wasn't that kind of baby. She never got any bigger, but she did learn to roll. Her little flat face went round and round. On her other side, her not face rolled round and round, too. She followed me everywhere. When I swam, she floated in the swimming pool, a platter for the sun. When I read, she was my peacefully blinking footstool. She fit so perfectly into the washing machine that perhaps I washed her more than necessary. But it was wonderful to watch her eyes slitted against the suds, a stray red sock swishing about her face like the tongue of some large animal. When you make up a good baby, other people will want one too. Who's to say that I'm the only one who deserves a dear little machine washable, ever so presentable baby? Not me, so I made a batch. But they weren't exactly like her. They were smaller and without any inborn dread. Sometimes I see one rolling past my window at sunset, quite unlike my baby, who, like any good idea, eventually ended up dead. See, it didn't get very happy at the end. <laughs> and I'm going to end on a, a newish one. Paper Symphony, Softly. When I'm afraid to sit still, I play my cardboard piano, 
sing into my paper mache microphone. It favors plosives like most microphones, so the word paper sounds like two cannonballs landing just shy of a ship. I wanted to sit in silence and think about a fish with a tiny golden brain or the feeling of a grin from within, but instead I wrote this song. Thank you.